You're listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with Molly Watts, episode 16. Hi, I'm Molly. After a lifetime living under the influence of family alcohol abuse, spending more than 30 years worrying about alcohol and my own drinking, believing I had an unbreakable daily drinking habit, I changed my relationship with alcohol forever. If you want to change your drinking habits, then Breaking the Bottle Legacy is for you. My goal is to help you create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, past, present, and future. Each week, I'll focus on real science and using your own brain to change your relationship with alcohol. Nothing has gone wrong. You're not broken. You're not sick. It's not your genes. And creating peace is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from, well, let's say it's a pretty dark day here in Oregon. It's very early this morning and from what it looks like, it's going to be raining, but hey, it's March, it's Oregon. We kind of have to expect it, right? Today on the podcast, I am thrilled to be speaking to Mary Hickey Reed. Mary is the executive director of Moderation Management and the author of Neighbor Carrie May's Handbook to Happily Drinking Less or Not Drinking at All, quite happily, with the help of online recovery community. And Mary is a wonderful example of one of the people who work for Moderation Management. Moderation Management is a completely volunteer-run organization with advisory oversight by some great professionals, researchers, doctors, and Really, they are dedicated to helping people change their drinking habits and to go about it in a way that is self-help guided and directed and really underscores the idea of moderation, obviously, hence the name, Moderation Management, right? I was looking forward to speaking to Mary for a long time, and I'm really excited to be able to share more about what Moderation Management is, how she came to be a partner with them and really just want to get the word out about moderation management as an opportunity to help people change their drinking habits. I came to MM because of Dryuary, and you've heard me talk about that on the podcast before. Dryuary.org is actually a website and a launch site that um, moderation management hosts. And so their goal is to get more people involved in dryuary and then get them involved in moderation management. And hey, it worked, right? (laughs) That's what happened for me. So at any rate, this is a, a wonderful conversation. And I hope you enjoy hearing from her as well. Here's my conversation with Mary Hickey Reed. Hi, Mary. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm so happy to get to finally get this on the schedule, get it recorded and share more about moderation management with folks. So thanks so much for taking the time. Hi, Molly. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, glad to be here. Are you really glad? Because I don't think you don't sound glad, Mary. You sound <laughs> kind of like I like I drug you through, you know, I don't know, to get you on the <laughs> So you're a reluctant interviewee is, I guess, the best way of putting it. Is that true? I guess, you know, we should have just, you should have just snuck up on me and, and uh, <laughs> I recorded our usual conversations. And right. Uh, the, yeah. Well, I am well, super glad to have you here and I appreciate you taking the time and I'm just thrilled to be able to talk to you and have us talk more about moderation management, which kind of seems funny because moderation management is not new. No, it's been around for what? 20 plus quite a long time. It's probably going on almost 30 years now. Yeah. In the introduction, I told everybody who you are, but tell me in terms of your relationship to moderation management now, but tell me about your journey with alcohol and how you came to be the executive director of moderation management. Well, I started out like lots of us, you know, I was the gawky, awkward, introverted teenager and uh, had my first drink at 14. And I was one of those that, you know, after that first drink, I was just waiting for the next drink. So Mm -hmm. high school, you know, weekends were spent kind of in a blur of parties and drunkenness. I got married early, uh, you know, kind of straightened up, you know, only drank on weekends occasionally, uh, but always drank heavily on those weekends. And so 
by my late twenties or early thirties, I knew I had a drinking problem. And uh, about that time, you started seeing, I remember seeing Audrey, who was the founder of Moderation Management on the talk shows. And she was talking about this new program called Moderation Management, where you didn't have to quit drinking completely. And I thought, wow, that's that's the thing for me, you know, because I didn't want to quit. I uh, didn't think I could quit with my uh, the people that surrounded me. So I went out and I lived in a small town in Kansas and I went out and ordered her book at the library and got it and read it. And uh, um, the problem was at that time, the Internet wasn't really up and going yet. Yeah. And so we didn't have online support. I was in a small town in Kansas. There were no face to face meetings. So shelved that book for about 20 more years till I was 47. And my drinking problem had grown to where I was basically drinking around the clock all day, every day. I had kind of retired in my mid thirties to go live on a sailboat. There was no structure in my life. We were getting up and drinking in the mornings and drinking during the day. And then I was starting to feel the physical effects with waking up every night with palpitations, getting up to drink to stop those palpitations. So I thought I've got to do something about it now. So I jumped on online and I jumped on one of the popular 12 step programs. At that time, I knew my biggest obstacle, I knew I probably needed to quit, but my biggest obstacle was going to meetings. I wasn't in a place physically or emotionally where I could get to meetings. And I, I still hate meetings. So I joined on this group. And the first thing I said, you know, here's my problem. Here's what I'm doing. And they said, you have to attend a meeting. And I clicked out of there and I clicked on another abstinence-based group, uh, Smart Recovery. They had a lot of great worksheets and a lot of great support, but still I wasn't ready for abstinence. So I clicked on, I thought, well, I wonder if moderation and management is online now. And I clicked on there and I was home. You know, nobody told me you have to do this first. You have to do this first. And then you need to do this. They just uh, said, we're glad you're here. So that's where I've been for almost 12 years now, I think. Wow. So, but I know from speaking with you, eventually you did enter a period of abstinence. So you did that through moderation management. I did. And uh, one thing that kept me from joining moderation management for quite a while was the 30 day abstinence period Uh that they recommend. Uh Right. You know, at the time I didn't know much about MM. I thought, I guess I thought somebody was going to come knock on my door and make sure I wasn't drinking, (laughs) but I finally joined, but I just knew I couldn't do 30 days without drinking. So I finally decided to join with the intention of never doing a 30. Right. I was going to just kind of go under the wire. Nobody, if nobody asked me, I wasn't going to tell them. I was there about a month. And by then I probably had gotten a few abstinent days in. And it's amazing how things change in a month. And someone asked me to buddy up with them on a 30. And I thought, oh, crap. (laughs) But I did it. And uh, uh, I didn't make it. I made it to the past 20 days, which was amazing. So I didn't make it. And I thought, well, I'm ready to moderate again. So I went out for about 10 days or two weeks and tried moderation and then went right back to my old drinking habits. Rinse and repeat, tried a 30 again, made it over 20 days, went back to trying to moderate, fell back into my old drinking habits and really kind of just repeated the cycle for a year. And I don't know how many 30s I, I tried, probably at least six. But at the end of the year, I'd kept a calendar that said M for moderation on the days that I moderated, D for drunk on the days I didn't moderate, and A for the days I abstained. So I counted up all those days. I was feeling like a total failure. I couldn't get the 30 in. I couldn't moderate. Uh, I counted up the days, and I found out that I had actually been abstinent over 66% of the year. Wow. It was, yeah, I know, because all you focused on was all your, all I was focusing on was all my failures. That's why I really recommend that people keep track even if it's just as simple as writing down uh, but like I did on a calendar. So at that point, I actually joined Women for Sobriety. And someone said, I still had no plan to abstinence. And somebody said to me, I am so tired of hearing about your day once. <laughs> and it kind of made me <laughs> mad. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to abstain for the foreseeable future. And I did. I chose abstinence at that point. I made it about 60 some days and I had and I drank again. But when I took that first drink, I knew I was going to go back to abstinence. And so I did. And I remained. I never said forever. I always I never said I was going to drink again, but I wasn't going to say I was never going to drink again. Right. So that lasted for about seven and a half years. And then 
we started doing what we call the moderation months at MM and they turned into the kickstart program that we have now. And I was, I was teaching these people tools and everything. And I'd been a member of MM the whole time. And I, I stayed active in the moderate community along with the MM Absters, which is our abstinence-based community. And I, at that time, people have asked me, said, why did you decide then? And, and I guess it's because I finally felt like maybe I could do it. Mm-hmm. So that was about a year and a half ago. And I decided to explore moderation again. But in the meantime, I had got, I had become involved in MM's administration. And if, <laughs> if anything shows that MM is supportive or whatever your choices are, they chose me to, or they asked me to become the executive director when I had, when I was abstaining and had been abstaining for quite a while. Yeah. I love your story because I often have people ask, you know, people kind of ask this question and I know you've heard it. I mean, it's, it's one of those questions that people ask is just, is moderation possible? People often come into the group, to the Facebook group, come around and they, they want to know, like they really, they want to know, like, is it possible? And I think you're a brilliant example of the fact that because scientifically, you know, I've talked to people, I've talked to people in, uh, that are, that are sober, that are in abstinence-based programs. And there is a, uh, a drive from them that they want to say that, that apps, that moderation is not possible, right? That they think that it's because that alcohol is an addictive substance. It's it, anybody that drinks has the potential to become addicted to it. And so therefore moderation isn't possible. And I'm always like, well, actually, (laughs) if you look at the, if you look at the people, there are examples. There are examples in moderation management. There are examples in HAMS, harms, harm reduction group of people that are very successfully moderating alcohol. Now, what I also say, and I say this on the show, on the podcast all the time is that that doesn't mean that it's possible for everyone. Right. So, Mm -hmm. but what I love about moderation management, and I think is so key and something that really aligns with what I talk about all the time is that you are in the driver's seat. You have control. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol and nowhere else. It is your decision. It is your choice. It is your, you know, everything that you do and want to do regarding your relationship with alcohol is possible. But that may mean ultimately, once you get clear on your own you know, what's happening for you and how alcohol is impacting for you. It may mean that abstinence is the best choice for you, Mm -hmm. but still, I think at the end of the day, I want people to feel empowered that they're the ones that are going to ultimately make that decision for themselves. Right. And I think that's confusing when people first come to moderation management because they're, they're used to, and it's what attracted me to MM is that they kind of let me design my own recovery. You know, they didn't say you had to go to this meeting, you had to do this. But also there were times because when we're in the midst of heavy drinking, we do want somebody to take control. You know, we want somebody to tell us what to do because we've tried everything on our own. Mm -hmm. And um, so I like to think of of MMs like we're a community of construction workers. You know, we're all busy building our own moderate houses and lives where we're making repairs or we're adding on rooms, but we're working side by side. And if somebody needs us to help them, we grab up our tool bags and we go over there. We're not going to tell them what kind of house they need to build or what they need in their house, Mm -hmm. but we're going to tell them what we, what worked for us and the mistakes that we made and how we fix those mistakes. And we learn from each other in that way. Uh, I always like when we hear that, you know, usually it's people that have joined abstinence based programs and that, and I'm not, going to batch any abstinence-based program. They've right. saved a lot of lives. And as I and I chose abstinence for a long period. Um, they usually say, well, yeah, I tried moderation for years and it never worked. But I always want to ask them, well, did you try moderation with the support of a community? Yeah. You know, and how many times did you try to quit on your own without the support of a community? And how did that work for you? So for me, and I guess for most of the members of MM, community is what makes a difference, that accountability. 100%. I I just did a podcast on my, what I call my intuitive drinking toolbox. And it was kind of what helped me change my relationship with alcohol. And my number four tool is, uh, is community and finding your tribe. Because 
I do not think that it is a, something that without it, and, and that goes for really any habit, in my opinion, that is doesn't serve you that you're trying to change. You need to find, be around people who are like-minded and who are wanting to do, create change in their lives and, and commit. And, and for me, changing my relationship with alcohol was the most important thing I needed to do. I wanted to ignore it for a long time and pretend like it wasn't the, the, you know, the thing that needed to change, but ultimately it, that is what was and finding a community to connect to who supported my own goals. And also where I felt like I could, uh, be a resource to other people as well. I think that's one of the beauties of MM is being able to, to support each other because when you're being, when you're sharing your own experience with other people and they're finding that, just like you said, when they're in that moment and it's, they're in a really tough spot and they hear from someone like you, who's been down the path that they're on and has come out on the other side and is successful. It's, it's inspiring. I agree. And I think, you know, having the compassion from others teaches us to be compassionate with ourselves. And, you know, we get so, it's still hard, even with the community, you know, you'll see all of our members on there occasionally sit beating themselves up and yep. it's hard not to beat yourself up, but you've got to remember, I think uh, one of our, one of my favorite members, not that I have favorites is <laughs> horse lover. She's, she's, she's always there for everybody. And we use, we use pseudonyms in some of our communities. Yeah. But she wrote an article that, you know, that's how she learned to be compassionate. She thought, how can I be kind to these other people that are making the same mistakes I am, Mm -hmm. but then be so harsh to myself? I talk about compassion and curiosity, especially when we make mistakes and when we go, when we drink off plan, that's actually number two in my toolbox is being able to, first of all, anticipate the fact that you will (laughs) go off plan. Because I think for a lot of us, at least for me, I used take, you know, my mistakes and my bad choices to uh, previous to me changing my relationship with alcohol. I used to use those as reasons, as, as examples of how I could just never change. Right. I would look at it and go, oh, well, see, there you go again. You just you're not somebody who can, it, you know, make a plan and stick to it. You're not somebody who has the willpower or the whatever the, you know, the self-control you lack discipline kind of, I'd have these narratives going on in my, in my head, right. That of course, just made me feel terrible. And when you feel terrible, all you want to do is get away from feeling terrible. And if you are someone that has used alcohol to buffer away your emotions, like that's what I did. That's what I would do. I felt terrible. So I'd want to drink. Then I'd feel terrible because I drank. And then I'd want to drink because I felt terrible. You know, it's a, it's a never ending circle unless you decide to understand ahead of time that you're going to, to make mistakes. And when you make mistakes that you're going to be compassionate and curious with yourself, you're going to take it not as a reason to stop trying, but as just a lesson to be learned. I agree. I tell myself all the time, I'm not a disciplined person, you know, because I'm not an exerciser. I don't do any of that. And uh, uh, so, you know, abstinence, it's been, it, it had been so long since I, chose abstinence and it became my routine. So I guess I didn't, it didn't take discipline anymore. So then when I went back to moderation, it's like, can I do this? Because I'm not a disciplined person. And I tell you, like the first time that I really struggled when I really wanted to drink, but I had told myself that I was going to abstain that day. Uh, and, and I succeeded. I felt so powerful. I, I mean, it was like, well, you know what? You can, you can you be are a disciplined person, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, I can do this with every and other areas of my life too, you know? Right. That's something that really was pivotal for me in changing my relationship with alcohol was understanding that all of those stories that I held on to for so long, being the adult child of an alcoholic and having lived a life with my mother for 40 plus years of her alcohol abuse, I had a lot of stories that I told myself that I simply believed were true, that I accepted as truths. They weren't true. They were just thoughts that I had. (laughs) And it was that ability and understanding that 
the way I thought about things created how I felt about things, which led me to the actions that I was taking. And the only way that I could change my future was to think about something else, was to think differently so that I would feel differently, so that I would take better actions. And really it's, you know, that future focus, we, we don't know, we can't change our past. We can't do anything about it. The only way the past exists now is in what we think about it. Right. So I can tell myself horrible stories or I can choose stories that help me and thoughts that help me feel better, that make me want to take better actions moving forward and to become someone who is disciplined or who is, you know, who can moderate successfully, who doesn't use. And, and this, for me, this was, was really my intention. Like I said, I wanted to find peace because mm -hmm. alcohol had been such a, uh, a, a, cause of so much unrest in my life from my my relationship with my mother to then my own dysfunctional daily drinking habit i wasn't in the same i wasn't a big i've never been a big binge drinker haven't had a lot of never used alcohol in a in massive ways but used it consistently and regularly and in a very unhealthy way on a daily basis for 30 plus years, you know, and I never, I like you, I never believed that I could take a 30 day that I would ever get to a point where I was, could be 30 days abstinent. Like, I, I mean, that thought to me was just crazy. And dryuary this year was my first, my first full 30 days in the last 30 plus years since I was pregnant, or not 30, 20, I guess, because I was pregnant sometime along back there. So, you know, I did manage abstinence <laughs> periods when I was pregnant. But other than that, no. So I digress. So let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals of moderation. So moderation management specifically. So everybody understands it's a lay led program. It's all volunteers. It's people that are, you know, nobody's giving you prescribing, just like you said, telling you what to do. But there are some steps that moderation management prescribes or says or suggests, right? Recommendations. Talk to me a little bit about those, the steps of change. Okay. Yeah. It's been a while since I read it. So I know. <laughs> I should have brushed up on this. It, it actually, our steps of change used to start out, you know, and, and we, and we've grown from this or we've, we've evolved from this, that one of the first things that MM told you to do was to prepare for a 30 day. Right. Like you said. Right. And that, that kept me from joining MM for a long time. And <laughs> I never want that 30 day to keep anybody else from waiting to join right. MM. Right. So, but during that 30 day, you were supposed to take a real account of your life, a cost and risk benefit analysis. You know, what, what are you expecting from MM? What are the problems that drinking has caused you? What do you, and that kind of thing, right. just like almost right. every recovery program out there ask you to do that. And then to figure out what your triggers are. You know, when we're drinking all the time, it's really amazing because we really don't know what our triggers or our habits are. We just mm -hmm. know we drink, you know, mm -hmm. I'm happy. I drink. I'm feeling stressed. I drink. I'm tired. I drink. So we don't really know if those are triggers, if they're habits. I walk in the door from work and the first thing I do is pour a drink. So you really, that 30 day abstinence or any time period in the beginning, when you don't drink, you recognize these things. You recognize mm -hmm. every, how often your brain is telling you to pick up a drink. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the important things to do is to start recognizing those things and to come up with other strategies mm -hmm. and to develop actually to really kind of grow up for me. You know, when I started drinking when I was 14, I never really developed any of these other coping strategies. So you do that. And that's supposed to help you later on to maintain moderation. And then during that 30 days, you also develop a plan. Planning is important in moderation. And, and I'm going to tell you, I just answered some questions from a, a journalist. And she said, what is the one thing you would tell people about moderation and, and that they don't know? And that moderation isn't the easier choice. You will hear a lot of times from people that have been in MM for a while that abstaining is easier and moderation is hard. And I used to resent that when I was abstaining because there's a whole different set of difficulty with that. But abstinence is a simpler choice. It's a, all you do is not drink. You don't right. have to get up every day and decide right. what you're going to do. You don't have to worry about that wedding in a month. You're just not going to drink. 
with MM, you have to make a plan. You have to stay vigilant. You have to stay uh, accountable. You have to track how much you're drinking and it's work. So during that 30 day break or at the very beginning of MM, you start thinking about what is my plan? What, what do I want MM to bring me? What do I want moderation to give my life? How am I going to implement? How am I going to get to that point to where I want to be drinking? Because most of us start join MM way before we're anywhere close to the guidelines that MM recommends. And again, the guidelines are just tools that we get. That's, that's the, an amount of alcohol that we feel will not interfere too much with your life. You should still be able to live a happy life following MM's guidelines. We're never going to say that drinking is healthy for you. The only healthy level of drinking is zero, but the guidelines kind of give you a baseline and Mm -hmm. everybody's different with that. But, uh, you know, so basically you you come up with your plan and you get to know what moderation looks like by watching the other people in the community. So I want to come back to something you said. So you said, you know, used to resent that people said that abstinence was harder than moderation or what or the other way around either way. And something you said is abstinence is simpler, right? The challenging part of either one of those equations, right? It is simpler to abstain because you're not having to think about anything. It's just not, you know, there is no decision fatigue. And that is one of the situations I talk about in my ebook, Alcohol Truths, How Much is Safe, is that if you're battling decision fatigue and you're making poor choices about alcohol, then abstinence is going to be a better choice because you're not, you know, you're taking things, the decisions out of the equation. I like to say, I don't, for myself, moderation is about being mindful and about creating a plan. And I don't think in and of itself, creating a plan is challenging. And I think that people need to get it into their, their mindset that you're taking the decision to drink out of your primitive, impulsive, habitual reward center brain, right. And moving it squarely into your prefrontal cortex, into your logical future focused adult brain that has your your true intentions, your best intentions at its, at its core, right? It's really where, what you, it's the only place, it's the only spot where we human beings separate ourselves from the animals. We are able to actually look into the future and be future focused, which is not something that our, you know, our mammal (laughs) cohorts can do. And so we have to, we have to have confidence and evoke that, that special trait that humans can do and put together a plan that really comes from our best and highest intentions and our best goals. Right. And I say to people all the time, you, you put together a plan, not because it's because you are trying to regiment yourself or constrain yourself. You put together a plan because it's really, truly what you want it's what you want. It's where you want your relationship to out al- with alcohol to be. And that's for me, doesn't feel hard. It feels empowering. It feels, you know, I'm like, I do this because this is what this is makes me feel healthy, makes me knows that it aligns with my long-term goals. I've taken into account the science of alcohol. I understand the trade, just like you said, doing a risk rewards analysis is important. Understanding the trade-offs both for, for physical health, for social health, for mental health, for financial health, all of those things, you should take those things into consideration when you're deciding what you want your relationship with alcohol to be. And moderation, this is the one thing that I, you know, for me, moderation, I've, I say, I just use this term and I'm now loving it. I've become an alcohol minimalist. And what that means for me personally is that I only want to drink alcohol when it's truly going to enhance a situation. It's going to be, you know, and I'm, I only want to drink enough so that it's really, truly, I'm getting the most benefit and the least cost risk reward, whatever, the least amount of bad impact. And I, it has been a work in progress for me. I used to be able to drink three to four drinks every night and have no real physical, 
consequences the next day, at least none that I was really significantly aware of. Not until I stopped, <laughs> not until I stopped drinking that much did I realize, um, you know, just my sleep alone, right? And but also anxiety and tons of other things that have been positively impacted by drinking much less. And now more than two drinks. And I honestly just do not feel very good at all. And so, and I don't, it, it's no longer has the same positive. I don't see a benefit for it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know I have a, a, a young man in our, in my uh, UK meetings, one of our zoom meetings. And uh, he came on board a, a few months ago and he was living in Finland and he was, he was separated from his wife who was living in the U S and he was partying hardy in Finland and, uh, you know, hanging around with his blokes and, and, and really drinking and uh, heavily. And then he decided to abstain because he was coming, he was moving to the U.S. and he wanted to kind of start fresh. And he kind of wanted, got all that out of his system. He was coming to live with his wife and for the first time. Uh, so he abstained for, I think, a month or two. And now he's back to moderate, moderate drinking and he's doing very well. But he's like, I'm not feeling anything. <laughs> You know, and you can almost hear the disappointment in his in his, in his uh, voice. And I think that's one thing that people that don't know about moderation have a hard time grasping. They think they're still going to get that everything that drinking excessively gave them, but they're just not going to have the problems. But you don't get that. Well, like no, you said, you can yeah, have two drinks. Truly, yeah, if you're truly moderating, if you're really wanting, I mean, but what I love about it is that that's, it's honestly where I want to be now. Mm -hmm. I don't have the same, and that's what I never really anticipated, actually not and didn't anticipate. I didn't believe that there would ever come a day uh -huh. when I wouldn't desire to drink, when I wouldn't desire alcohol. I mm -hmm. thought that I would be, you know, gritting my teeth, white knuckling it, <laughs> through 30 days of abstinence or any time, any day that I was alcohol free, I imagined it to be just, you know, torture basically. Right. And, right. and th that I never anticipated be that it was possible to be on the other side of that. Right. And like, like you, this man, you know, he, he's enjoying his life. Yeah. He's, he's saying, yeah, I'm kind of disappointed that I'm not feeling, you know, after two months of abstinence, I'm not feeling any effects from alcohol, but he doesn't want to change that either. And, uh, and, and it is a evolution, I guess, or a surprise when we've actually find our members and they, they you won't believe this when you first join MM that they start looking forward to their abstinent days. Yeah. I mean, and it's true. And I love that. I, I'm so excited to share this with the listeners because um, because moderation management so clearly aligns with everything that I talk about in developing this peaceful relationship with alcohol, um, the plan, the reviewing your plan, knowing your triggers, being able to set yourself up for success, all of those kind of things are so important to me and what has been my journey for somebody that's just considering this just considering changing their relationship with alcohol. If they are coming to moderation, Tell me how they, the best ways for them to get involved with moderation management. I think the best thing to do is to go to our website, mm -hmm. uh, Which look I'll over the resources, sure yep. <laughs> moderation.org, how to get started, and then go check out our communities and find one that works for you. I, as you and I have spoken, communities were what made the difference for both of us or mm -hmm. for me anyway. And oh yeah, for me too. to somewhat level. And uh, that's where you're going to learn. The most is in our community. And then you're going to be encouraged not to look at the big picture. Don't look at those guidelines and say, I'm going to be there in a week, but to find a step that's going to be successful for you. That's what I push more than anything. We hear people that say, okay, I'm going to jump on that 30 or I'm going to do my first abstinence day in 30, you know, 30 years after I've been drinking nightly at Four, five to six drinks a night or more, and I'm going to go abstain. Well, that may be too big a step for you. So choose a step that you feel you'll succeed at mm -hmm. because we've all tried all these big steps that haven't worked for us and we're in a place of defeat and we need to build for, on a place of success. So even if that's just producing by half a drink a night, it's a start. Mm -hmm. For me, for sustainable change, it took me two years to get mm -hmm. from where I was to where I am. And I, at first, was just meeting myself where I was at. Even 
planning ahead for the number of drinks that I was drinking and not trying to reduce that, but just I, making the decision ahead of time. Again, taking the, the decision out of my impulse brain, responding to an urge in the moment and planning ahead and sticking to that plan was a just a big step. And then it took me a while to actually then just reduce that number and then reduce that number and then add in an alcohol free day. It, you know, it was a progression. And I think that the most sustainable change is if you're allowing yourself and meeting yourself where you're at and setting yourself up for those kind of successes. And I think that's where people need to learn to be patient with themselves mm -hmm. and expect that from the beginning. You know, our first week in our kickstart program, we focus on not really making any changes at first, just realizing where we are to start tracking, you know, tracking in itself and being honest with ourselves and not critical about where we are mm -hmm. because it is, that's where we are. Yeah, that there's nothing we can do about it now. You know, I mean, we can't go back and change that, but recognizing and, and being aware of that and be, it's a big step. And in that in itself usually helps people, like you said, remove that from their animal brain back here that's yeah. saying more, 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 more without any thought and put it up front to where they actually have to think about it. Yeah. You mentioned Kickstart. So Kickstart is one of the programs of moder the, the kind of the monthly programs of moderation management. There are different. Mm -hmm. So we just talked, we talked a little bit about Dryuary, which was in January and um, Kickstart, which came right after in February. There'll be a Kickstart again later this year. Is that accurate? There is. There's a Kickstart probably in June. And the reason Kickstart came about, MM had already prided itself on not being a program. Right. It was just a community and adding <laughs> tools. And we still don't have a program. Basically, but like me, people came and said, you know, tell me what to do. We need to know at least some, some framework here in which to start. So we just decided that every day we'd write a little post and share a tool. And that's how Kickstart grew. You know, we write, we do an inspirational post. We're not therapists. We don't advise. We might share some information from a therapist book or from a therapist that works with us. But we share an inspirational post or an observation that we've, or some, one of us has learned along the way, a tool and a task for that day. And then a NA or low alcohol content beverage. Mm -hmm. So that goes on every day for about a month. We form our own Facebook group just to kind of give a closer knit group than if people join our Facebook group on, on MM right now, it's 2000 people. And that seems like too many people. So usually there's about 80 people on our Facebook group for kickstart. So it's a little smaller start and not that many people are actually posting. We get a lot of lurkers, still the majority are lurkers mm -hmm. and we have our own meetings. So they're, they, they feel a little safer to begin with. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I will, we will definitely link all that. And everybody should know that when you go to moderation.org, there's literally a place that says start here. And so it gives you kind of a list of all the different resources we've talked about, mentioned the steps of change. It's also going to give you links to all of the different groups at moderation management, because moderation management does not just count on the Facebook tool, the Facebook private group, though the Facebook private group is awesome. There's also a forum and listserv too, right? So there's really like so many different ways to be involved. Yeah, and the difference between the forum and the listserv is that when we started out, we were like AA and we were really big into an anonymity, anonymity and, and project. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's important. And it's still important for a lot of people. You know, truly our social media is a risk and we can only be so private and we can only protect our members so much on Facebook. We haven't had any problems with the Facebook group and uh, ever anybody, we all rely on each other to guard each other. And that's worked very well, but there are still people that worry and they don't want anybody to know their real names or at, how to contact them in the real world. And so our communities such as our forum and our listserv allow them to do that. You communicate with a pseudonym, a username and nobody has any access to any of your personal information. Yeah. So if you're more comfortable in those communities, that's they're there for you. Also, I always encourage everybody to join the forum because it's like an old message board and there's lots of discussions and information there and they're all organized in threads. Yeah. So you can get in there and you can read where it's hard to, you know, find We're information. All on Facebook, yeah. Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's also meetings every week. So mm -hmm. let's talk about those. There's different groups yeah. and different meetings. There is, and most of our meetings follow the same format. 
And now all of them are on Zoom because we're not having face-to-face meetings. And right. because of COVID, actually, our Zoom meetings have boomed and everybody loves them because they can go to more than one meeting a week. Whereas if you were in Denver, uh, you only had one meeting on Tuesday. That's the right. only meeting you had. So now anybody can drop in on a meeting any day of the week if they feel the need. So we most of them are the same. We do have some that are particular. We have our women's meetings. Uh, our New York City women's meeting has been going on a long time, started out as a face-to-face meeting in New York. It's on Wednesday nights, but now since it's on Zoom, anybody can join. We have our other women's meeting on Thursday night. We have our, there's a 20-somethings meeting every other Thursday, I think it's two Thursdays mm-hmm. for the younger crowd. So we're really glad. I think that's one thing that MM does. I think that's one fault of the abstinence-based recovery program is that when our society was focused as that as the only solution for so long it delayed people reaching out for help so Mm -hmm. we're glad to see that we're having younger people coming so we have a 20 something meeting that's awesome Uh, yeah we have a men's meeting on saturday we have a new meeting that i'll be helping to lead which is called uh, we're calling it uh moderation curious because this is for people that have abstained for a long period of over a year and are now returning to explore moderation. We nice. feel like there's a there's a unique need there. We have a whole different set of guilt <laughs> about right. coming back to drinking when we should have been happy in our absence life. But uh and, and we we have a you know we're a little bit trepidatious. So those are our meetings and then we have our regular general meetings throughout the week. Yeah, just a lot of resources, lots and lots of resources, folks. And of course, I will link all of that in my show notes. So you'll be able to find not only the moderation.org website page, but the Facebook group. And I'm not going to probably list all the meetings, but those are on the website as well. So, well, Mary, I could talk to you forever about uh, this. (laughs) This is such a great, I mean, I just love the organization. So happy to have been able to meet you, talk to you, get involved Mm -hmm. more with it and to share the message and to spread the word about it. Because really this is, this is a time right now coming out of COVID. So many people um, found themselves drinking more than they wanted to um, (laughs) in a, in a very stressful time. And so there's never been a more important time to help people get, uh, in control and and to feel like they really do have the power to change their relationship with alcohol, make it what they want it to be, whether that ends up being abstinence, moderation, one of the two, right? And and hopefully, no matter what, they will come and explore moderation.org. Check us out. Come be a part of any of those groups. You'll find amazing support welcoming people who really want to share their journeys with you and support you along the way. I want to mention one other group, and that's yeah. our MM Absters group. Yeah. Um, yeah. Many of our members will, you know, they'll they'll be introduced to abstinence through moderation management and to the point that they actually become more comfortable choosing to abstain, either for the foreseeable future or for even, you know, some do it for six months, some do it for a month, some say, well, what we used to call permanent abstinence, they're choosing forever. And we do have a group. Uh, of sub, a subgroup of members that have made that choice. And yeah. again, you don't have to choose forever to become a member of our MM Absurds group. We have a listserv and they now do have a Facebook group also. So, and you're welcome to actually go and explore other absence based groups. Um, MM Absurds has members that are in AA, Women for Sobriety, Smart, other things that are out there. We encourage people to get out. We're not exclusive. Yeah. You know, find all the groups, join all the groups, get all the information that you need and bring <laughs> right. it back to us. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Well, that is awesome. And definitely, uh, I hope people will come. I hope they will check us out. And I, I just appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you. It wasn't as painful as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, see, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Once you get me talking about it, you can't shut me up. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mary. Thank you for listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Take something that you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.